Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to episode 30 of Deep in the Novo. I'm Ryan Novozinski, joined here, as always, by my co-host, Sadiq Tuma. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about OSU versus the Baylor Bears. My goodness, these these Baylor Bears are a totally different team than last season um, in terms of coaching staff, uh, in terms of success, but similar at the quarterback position and a couple other positions out there. Sure. But um, it's an interesting team, right? They had a lot of COVID issues during uh, the beginning of the season. Um, but now they're sitting here and, and really record wise, it's not looking too hot for them, but, um, it's still a formidable opponent because, you know, as you look at last week with OSU, you know, having to, uh, you know, get upset by TCU, you never know what can happen this season. Right. And especially during the COVID season, an OSU team could lose to a two and six Baylor bears team. Although we will talk about today, how either likely or unlikely that may be. Let's start with Charlie Brewer the guy who is returning for Baylor, right? This quarterback who, you know, had some good success last season um, is, is a solid quarterback in the big 12. I'd say is one of those guys that I feel like has been there for, for quite a bit. Um, what do you see from him and, and, and how do you think he's going to attack OSU? Uh, the old saying is you're only as good as your record is, mm-hmm. but at the same time, teams with bad records can show up yep. or teams with good records, vice versa. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, you're right. This Baylor team, I think I didn't say this about TCU, but I think this Baylor team's a lot better than they are than the record ensues. And a lot of it came down to injuries and COVID. I think in the beginning, obviously, the game was postponed. <laughs> they had a lot of issues. They did new coach, new system, new everything. But now yeah, they've really settled in nicely. And you, obviously, with any team, you start their quarterback with Charlie Brewer, who was obviously excellent last season. But yeah, he's he's got a tough situation there because their offensive line is really mm-hmm. really bad. I mean, it's 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 up there as one of the worst O lines, I believe. Yeah, uh, they give up a lot of traction in the run game, the pass game, and you see it in the run game more so because with your pass game, if you have a quarterback, if you have receivers, if you have a scheme, you can kind of get around those O line woes a little bit, right? Sure. But you see with OSU, how bad is? I mean, Chuba Hubbard was you know Heisman hopeful. That was like people didn't call him Chuba Hubbard; they called him. Heisman hopeful, Trevor yep. Hubbard. <laughs> but now look at him. If you blink twice, and or if you just close your eyes last season, you wouldn't have known. You thought Trevor Hubbard's probably one of the worst running backs in the Big 12. Sure. Or just, you know, an average guy. I mean, that's what you would have thought, right? Because you look at some <clears> of these games, and it's just the O-line. And football's like that. You can have skill players. You can have these guys. But it really starts your line. And Charlie Brewer is, you know, he's a one-read uh, quarterback, two-read quarterback. Just one, two, and tuck. Right? Go. And that's, A, a product a little bit of just who he is. And, you know, a lot of quarterbacks, we forget so much because we see so many Trevor Lawrences and Justin Fields and these talented right. guys. But a lot of quarterbacks are just one, two, read, and then tuck the ball because that's the nature of college football more so, right, than it is now. And with how good schemes are and how bad defenses are. And, you know, I mean, not even that bad sometimes, but just the way, you know, lack of press coverage, little different intricacies and nuances in college football, we don't always see the same thing. But... Charlie Brewer is definitely, like I said, he's a one-read quarterback, like Alan Bowman was, mm-hmm. but he's got some talent, too. Not a, Nothing like a crazy arm is releasing him super quick or anything, but he can throw the ball down the field, and he's got a great group of receivers, right? A bunch of guys with track speed, starting with R.J. Snead sure. out there, right? Tyquan Thornton. you got some talented guys out there. They throw the running backs a lot as well, which helps alleviate some of the pressure, but I like are you when you watch their offense, there's a lot to like. You see some of the concepts. They run a lot of counter runs, mm-hmm. which uh, would work better if they had a better offensive line. <laughs> but then they, they do some interesting things where, you know, they'll run a boot one side and the old line will move that way. And you and as a defense, you're kind of assuming, okay, the entire offense is going that way. Then suddenly they throw it to the other side. Mm-hmm. Those are things that great offensive minds usually do. But the problem is the execution isn't there because of the offensive line. Yeah. Itself, right. The play design is interesting. And like I said, there's a lot of things to like. But the reason their offense really hasn't capitalized is – Hey, the run game. This is, a, I believe, a bottom 10 run game. They don't run it a lot, but still, like, none of these running backs are, you know, putting up a lot of stats. A lot of them, at, their yards per carry is pretty down there. They can't gain a lot of traction there. And then the run game, and then the pass game, you just have, you know, a lack of offensive line, and then suddenly you can't throw the same way, even with a guy like Charlie Brewer. And that's really the, the issue with this team. Sure, yeah. And, and I remember back going back to, like, week one, week two, you and I were talking about, we were previewing Kansas, and we were thinking – my goodness, this Baylor offensive line, even after one week, we knew that they, they, they were, you know, struggling because they made Kansas look like a really good team. Right. I mean, yeah, you, you wa- I was watching that game and, you know, Sam Bird and these guys on the defensive line. Yeah, you got a little bit of talent there, but, they, you know, they were just getting past Baylor's O-line. Yeah. And that was really a testament to, I mean, we know who Kansas is, right? <laughs> but that was a testament to just how weak this Baylor O-line is up front. And that's a real weakness. And you saw OU at times, they were just getting past them easy. You know, just I mean, obviously Ronnie Perkins and these guys are so talented. But it doesn't really take so much talent to just one dip move, not even go go to go untouched mm-hmm. from you know wide nine position out there 
it's it's <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah, it really is, and that's really difficult for Charlie Brewer in this offense. Sure, yeah, and and but they they do have weapons, like you said. There are some sure. weapons. Um, if given the right opportunity, right? If given enough time, that you know th- that there's some receivers out there. There's uh, R.J. Sneed, right? right? He's he's a solid wide receiver. Um, you look at some of these running backs too. It's okay, and and it can be good in the pass game, and I think it it, it could be beneficial for them. But we just have to see how that offensive line is going to play. I, I mean that that I think. You know, in many cases this season, that's been some of the keys of the season, and and that's obvious in, in football. But man, it's going to start up front for Baylor, and and uh, the two wins shows that many times this year it has not bre- uh, come into fruition for them. And it works hand in hand. I mean, absolutely, we'll get into Baylor defense in a bit, but the offensive defense work hand in hand when you're constantly, you know, punting away, losing field position, uh, trying to play ball control, but you can't because you're getting no traction. I mean, think about it: making your offense or your defense defend. 40, 50 yards instead of 80, 90 yards is a huge difference, mm-hmm. right? And it, it just changes the complexion of the game. And a weak offense will do that to a really good defense, make it look a lot worse than it has because not only giving them worse positions to deal with, it's also just like an energy thing, right? Sure. I've seen it before where, you know, backup quarterbacks come in, you get a little bit of spark, and suddenly the defense plays a lot better. It happens. It, it's a true thing, confidence, mm-hmm. energy. And, yeah, I mean, if you can't get any traction on offense, it really does hurt your defense. And this O line is really a worry for Baylor, and that's a that's a big thing. Yeah, totally. Uh, and then going going, um, what do you think attack wise? How do, how do you think OSU can attack this offense? Right. Uh, I mean, I think it starts up obviously up front, and I think if we see like last week, um, if you have a solid game from these linebackers, and then uh, mixed in with this defensive line, as the linebackers and defensive line, uh, specifically the defensive ends, last week had a great game. I think you can see you know this OSU team garnering even more stats than they did last week stopping a run game or stopping you know just an offense in general it does start in the trenches Mm -hmm. it is a cliche but you talk about israel antoine brendan evers cameron murray all these guys in the middle and obviously tyler lacy trace ford you know create a new line of scrimmage get in get penetration get in the backfield and you know stop this attack at its core and then there's just not a worry for osu obviously osu's d line is very deep it's talented but it's obviously not ou right Mm -hmm. you talk about ronnie perkins and nick benito and um, Isaiah Thomas and all the great guys there. I mean, OSU's D line is still very talented. Malcolm Rodriguez, linebacker, Amen. You got those guys. Obviously, you're too deep, right, with Calvin yeah. Bundage and everyone. But from there, it, it does start the D line, and it starts there. If you can get penetration, you can stop them. It really just neutralizes the entire attack. Yeah, totally. Um, and then this Baylor team, their defense is revitalized this year too, right? Let's fl- uh, flip o- flipping over to them. Um, Dave Aranda came in to this this program, obviously. You know, uh, bolstering his resume, you got you got uh, some experience at LSU. You got, man, so many years of, of uh, defense coordinator uh, positions, both at LSU, both at Wisconsin, right? Even Utah at a point. And he's got, you know, a, an impressive defensive mind. And he's and he's uh, made this Baylor defense, which was solid last season. He made them even better. And I think that once you, um, you know, sort of get into getting into the specifics of it, you know, they have a 3-3-5 um, and they have some weird positions, which we love. We love uh, defenses with weird positions. Um, so let's t- so br- let's talk about some of these. Right. Let's talk about the star. Let's talk about, you know, the jacket there, too. What do you see from this uh, Baylor attack? Uh, consensus before this year, Dave Aranda and Brent Venables are probably the two best sure. coordinators by far, right? Mm-hmm. You make a good case for Dave Aranda being number one. But yeah, he's he's brought an interesting defense here with a 3-3-5. Three, three, um, it's, more, it's like a 3-4, three, 3-3-5 three, three, kind of hybrid because mm-hmm. of that star linebacker. Jalen Petrie is an exciting player to me. He's got such good IQ, instincts, player recognition. You see him in certain plays where, you know, there's a play I was watching, uh, crossing route by Denzel Mims. Or, sorry, not Denzel. Marvin. <laughs> Marvin Mims, that's right. <laughs> of course. Confused me too. Confused, yes. So he's just running there. Jalen Petrie's covering another tight end. But as soon as, before Spencer Riley even cocks his arm back mm-hmm. to throw the, sh- the crossing routes, uh, Jalen Petrie's recognized it. You see him put his foot back and immediately attack on that crossing route. Negative two yard loss. Mm-hmm. It's these things. You see it because he, it's, it's film study. It's recognition. And you see it a couple times where he makes plays. He's going into zones where he's not supposed to because he knows where the ball is going. Right. That's film study. That's understanding your opponent. And that's where it starts with. I mean, you got, yeah, the Jack, who's essentially like West Virginia had, that hybrid pass rushing linebacker, mm-hmm. mostly plays on the D-line. But, yeah, I mean, you got some interesting things. And I love the way this defense schemes. How They're, they're just so intelligent, and they swarm to tackle. That's what they really do really well. And that's something that comes from coaching, where you're not just sending one guy who's around there. You're sending all 11 guys. Sure. When the ball goes somewhere, go attack and tackle. And that's what they do so well. I mean, they, they kept an OU team down pretty hard. And, yeah, OU ended up scoring 31 points, which, first off, is very impressive. Yeah. But it's extra impressive when you consider the field position OU is handed. 
we talked about how offense and defense go hand in hand with Charlie Brewer and this, you know, offensive attack mm-hmm. that was lackluster at times. They're kicking the ball away and suddenly OU has 50 yards to go, but still Baylor will stop him a couple of times. It's hard to ask them to stop every single time. And that's why I think they do such a good job, but it comes down to coaching, defense coordinator, Dave Aranda, mm-hmm. and just, you know, getting these guys. First of all, they're so smart. They obviously study film really mm-hmm. well and you see them move and they swarm to, t- to tackle so well. But what I love is really their, um, their scheming in terms of delayed blitzes mm-hmm. and, and really just, you know, they, what they did, they did remember about this over Texas, Texas Tech as mm-hmm. well, where most plays, especially on third down, you'd see six guys in the box, six guys on the D line. You don't know who's rushing. You don't know who's dropping. And da- Baylor would do that a lot where they'll bring five, six guys and suddenly drop three, or maybe they'll rush. Six. Yeah. And, and that's the thing. You got to identify that that comes on coaching staff. That comes on Spencer. That's going to come on there. And you got And that's interesting, but they do a lot really well where they'll have Dylan Doyle, their talented inside linebacker or, one person or another, Jalen Petrie, come in late. And where you look like, okay, four blitzing, then suddenly the last person will come, free runner. Mm-hmm. Great scheming. That's play design. That's what Jim Knowles does so well, right? And that's what Baylor does so well, and that's what really helps them. Yeah, and, it, and it's interesting. Back, back-to-back weeks now, uh, TCU did a little bit of, of interesting play designs sure. on the defensive end too. So it's going to be it's gonna be fascinating to see. Um, another thing that sort of, uh, I guess, diminished Baylor's season a little bit was was the loss of uh Terrell Bernard right, right. And, and and the fact that he went down with a shoulder injury about a got a probably about a month ago now um yeah and and he was the, one of their best players in the defense right yeah, he, he was, was an NFL draft kind of guy so the way they've had to adapt to uh how have you seen that all season long right and and how they've adapted you know through through losing one of their best players in the defense yeah I saw the OU game and Abram Smith there who's replacing him next mm-hmm. to Dylan Doyle he's a weak side linebacker Smith is uh, he's he's a, he's a very good player. He's sure. athletic. He can track guys down. He's got a high motor. I mean, all these guys got high motors, really. Mm-hmm. I think it's like it's almost like you know, blink. It really hasn't made much of a difference. The big difference is the offense for me because they go hand in hand, and you're just putting them in worse positions. Makes the defense look a little bit worse. The defense is still really talented. Their numbers are up there. They're doing a very good job. I think they're a team where that's that's really where you worry, especially with this OSU O line who's been so questionable mm-hmm. at times, right? Uh, how do they contain them? How do they, you know, recognize what's Mike Gundy going to do? Mm-hmm. That's a difficult thing. It's Tyron Wallace going to be healthy. Um, the number three, the cornerback for Baylor, he is very talented. He is, you know, one of the better corners yeah. in the Big 12, right? One of the best for sure. And last week, TCU did a good job uh, right. cornerbacks-wise yeah. against Tyron Wallace. Travis Hodges mm-hmm. Tomlinson did a great job on him. And, I mean, yeah, he did. The, mm-hmm. the couple touchdowns you saw that from Tyron Wallace were the long plays were against C.J. Caesar. And it's it's one of those things where it's it's going to be interesting because you got some guys there. JT Woods is safety, but a guy I really like on the D line is William Bradley. Yes, King. me too. He is a strong. He's the the grad transfer, I believe, from Arizona, mm-hmm. or Arkansas. State. Arkansas. Yep. He is so strong. That's that's what you see. You know, he's a good pass rusher because he had put up the numbers. But you watch him; he's got great hands, and he has got a lot of power because he just pushes guys down. Yeah. But he's always getting your face, and then suddenly he'll just get around you. Not the fastest guy, but he is very. He's got a lot of power. A yeah. Great bull rush. Great rusher, great pass rusher. And, yeah, I mean, TJ Franklin's there on the other side. Josh Landry, you got some good guys up front. And the back end, you have talent as well. This is a very talented Baylor team. Yeah, Bradley King, he sticks out to me too. I mean, he's a guy that can get out there and push his way into the backfield, right, or, or yeah. stay contained and uh, play smart football, right, and, and uh, do a good job with that. So this Baylor team's talented, right? Sure. And, and um, you, you know, you get down to it too. What do you see? Because I remember uh, you talked about number three uh, for Baylor and the cornerback – what do you th- see from this Baylor secondary that that uh, and and how they might attack OSU, right? Because because OSU right now, I mean, outside last week, what we saw was outside of Tyler Wallace, it's a little bit one dimensional. Sure, yeah, I mean they they run a lot of zone as well, and they have they kind of split their concepts, like you said, and a lot of it comes from the front seven. It, pass rush and cornerbacks work hand in hand. You can be elite in one category, but if you're not in the other, it really makes no difference. Sure. And with OU, you saw you saw a lot of um, them covering up really well. But then it was just Spencer Spencer Rattler on the run, mm-hmm. which is so difficult to defend. I keep saying Spencer Rattler is – he's obviously he – can, he can strike you from the pocket. He can find this guy. He's got a great arm, great passer. But when he's on the run, he is so dangerous because not only is he going off script, he keeps – he's got great vision. Mm-hmm. He finds guys, and he can make throws so well as if he's just standing straight. Yeah. And that's where you saw a lot of those big plays, a lot of those touchdowns came from, you know, Spencer Rattler breaking out of the pocket and then suddenly finding someone because the pass rush had gotten to him. But – 
it's one of those things where, I mean, Spencer Sanders is talented, but he's not, I don't think he's as good as Spencer Rattler is on the run or just in general, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> I don't think, yeah. Right. But it, it's, it's going to be interesting how they contain him. I think this is cor- these cornerbacks, uh, Cameron Barnes didn't play last week, but they, they had some COVID issues with some of their players, but they mm-hmm. got some interesting, interesting talent there. <laughs> yeah. And remember this game was supposed to be played so many weeks ago too. Right. You talk about COVID issues. I mean, and this... I think Baylor's gotten so much better since then. I, I think so too. I think you, you look at um, OSU playing them back then. I think this might have been a blowout. Right now, I'm, I'm a little bit conflicted because sure. I, I don't know how this is going to go. I don't know. This could sway either way, right? This could be uh, either a close game uh, like it was last week, obviously, with TCU coming out, out in front. Um, or it could be like the Texas Tech one where it was uh, a close game, but then uh, obviously OSU coming out. But, man, who knows what's going to happen with this. Uh, so before we get into some OSU keys to win, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's If you were to give it a grade, right, between some of the COVID issues, between – Gosh, I feel like Baylor played three or two games when OSU played eight or something like sure. that. Uh, they had a ton of COVID issues this year. Between that, between some of the PR nonsense with that, um, and between the record right now, how would you rate Dave Aranda's first season as a Baylor coach? Well, and you take that all into account, you have to go like an A, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> just because you, you talk about how much you have to deal with, and you, you just can't fight science. You can't debate science. Mm-hmm. It's it's You handed all these things, and it's like, how do you deal with it? What do you do from there? And I think Dave Aranda's program, like I said, they've gotten better. Mm-hmm. They also put things, you know, they put things things away they've it's like it, what people don't realize with the COVID issues are every just about almost every team mm-hmm. dealt with it over the summer and a lot of them dealt with a lot of issues but the difference was by the time the season started Baylor had very few then I guess but they're not gonna get credit for that they're gonna get hate for the fact that they um they got COVID issues during the season because that's all people saw right sure I mean all these teams were basically hiding how many cases they had during the summer essentially yeah <laughs> right and and i think they've done such a good job i think at first dave aranda not they look shaky but obviously there were struggles with the first year coach and he's gotten a lot better he's gotten this team to a much better sense he's really taken over taken the role of head coach very well which is very different from being a defensive coordinator he's got this defense playing really well mm-hmm. i think i think once they fix the o-line down the road this would be good a very scary Baylor team. Sure, I think so too. I think once he builds his program, he's going to be a, a solid head coach in this Big 12, and he's one of the guys you can look at, right? There's a lot of new bi- uh, Big 12 coaches, I feel like, in the past two years, and sure. you can look at him as one of the uh, more solid hires. Uh, yeah. I, I know a lot of people down there in, 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 in Lubbock, you know, in the Waste Trip of Lubbock, I don't think they're really happy with Matt Wells, so I don't know. Who knows what's going to happen with him, but yeah, I guess hats off to him because he's having a solid season so far, and all things considered. You had to put it contextually. Um, Let's talk about OSU's keys to win, okay? Sure. If OSU is to win this game, they have to do what? <laughs> they have to block really well at <laughs> first. And, but they also, I think, now seeing them, they have to establish the run game. Mm-hmm. Right? You talk about them being one-dimensional talent walls. I think you got to create holes through your blocking, obviously. Yep. I mean, it's even h- harder now with Tevin Jenkins out. Obviously, they did against Texas Tech, but that's Texas Tech. This is a really good Baylor line, very good Baylor front. It's you got to block up there. you got to establish the run game, and a very good one. Make the looks easier for Spencer Sanders. You know, get – you know, get your play action work and get some of these guys. I mean, if, you, if you're really so depleted, get Jelani Woods the ball, right? Mm-hmm. Get him up those seam routes. Get Logan Carter the ball. Get Dylan Stoner the ball down the field. You have different things. Adjust some of your concepts, your theories. Because this Baylor team is not going to keep showing you the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. That's the difference. This is a very good, very smart Baylor defense. Get them the ball in the States. Get it down the field. You know, adjust up your concepts and change up the things you're doing. Because obviously it's not working right now. Yeah, yeah, and and I think uh, you know the, with OSU's offensive line, I mean the way they blocked last week was uh, the way they blocked against Texas Tech is what you want to see every sure. single week, and and obviously you can't get that, but man, at least try to replicate that a little bit. Where does this Baylor defense? I guess uh, I can't give you maybe like a you know I'm not going to put you on the spot and have you do it like quantifiably through every single team this season, but where if you were to put it you know in some sort of range where would you rank it in terms of defense osu win against for baylor yeah yeah it's 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 up there in the middle i'd say yeah i think it might be even like top five i'm trying to yeah all the defenses it might actually be like three or four the way they're playing right now yeah statistically and just their improvement now yeah maybe like three or four without thinking about it too much exactly that's what i'm thinking i'm like i said in the sort of middle but like upper echelon of it right Right. so so that's what i'm thinking i'm thinking this osu offensive line going up against this uh, tough baylor defensive line too uh, especially in the defensive ends i i think that osu can get it done right if here's the deal a three-man front with osu this season i think it's you know you look at it against tulsa right uh and who else had it gosh i believe kansas did it a little bit um a couple other teams 
and I think they blocked well pretty per, for the most part against them. But yeah. obviously, there's there's schemes in there. There's swarming attacks like you talk about. You swarming tackling that that once Baylor gets in cohesion there, it's going to be a mess up there. And, uh, and you ha- yeah, you have the three man front, but you also have the jack linebacker. Big, yeah, exactly. Right? You you have these different things, and that just makes it harder. That, yeah, <laughs> you don't know where they're lining up. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't know if they're gonna drop, if they're gonna stay, and it just it changes with the complexity, no doubt. Sure, it's gonna be it's gonna be a complex system, and and let's see how OSU uh, OSU's offensive line can go up against it um but like you said i think keys to the game wise i think if you talk about opening up some of these holes uh with that offensive line i think that osu is going to thrive in this game and i and i, and I don't think it it might look a little bit like if they this te- these two teams played in you know what was it week three week four sure. but it all comes down to that it all comes down to the, what this offensive line could do and and man i mean for OSU fans' sake, I mean, let's hope they can uh, give Desmond Jackson some more uh, run, running lanes. Do we know any of the statuses right now of, of, of Edley Brown or anyone like that? Yeah, we'll never know with my opinion. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, if I had to guess, I would think Desmond Jackson, right? Mm-hmm. But it's it's one of those things. Um, we, It's, yeah, it, it's you know, establishing up the middle and then going from there because it, it is a difficult thing. It really is. And and this you said the Baylor team's different, and also the OSU team's different. Oh, yeah. Right? They've sustained so many injuries, so many key injuries everywhere uh, a lot <laughs> right <laughs> guys have been hurt i mean trey sterling you feel like he's been playing hurt the entire season sure. who's now i mean established himself one of the best safeties in college football mm-hmm. uh yeah it's a, it's a different thing but it'll be interesting to see how this se- team closes out i have one final question for you okay do you think that desmond jackson could lead osu in rushing yards this season that's a good question actually what's he at right now he is at 488 tuba is at 625 488. Well, I guess if you count, there's a bowl game, depending on how. what if Chuba Hubbard does. I think he But might. even just this game itself, I mean, there's a chance, right? There yeah. really is. Desmond Jackson's a talented guy. He De- really is. He's not only a talented guy, they're giving him so many carries. They're giving they him, like, freaking 100 he carries, it seems like, every day. He played 100% of snaps last game. Sure. I, yeah, I think he might be able it's to get it done. for running back. I know. Happen. Could you imagine in, in these three games that, that he's really been the star of the show, he might be able to outrush Chuba Hubbard. I mean, I, if you told me that at the beginning of the season, I would have slapped are you, you kidding me? <laughs> we would have thought that was coming from one of the you know morons we know. Uh, but that is all we have for the show today. Uh, thank you all for listening and tuning in uh, to Deep in the Novo. Um, continue looking at all of our Okali coverage at Okali.com, at Okali on Twitter, and at Okali Sports on Twitter for Ryan Novozinski and Sadiq Tuma. Have a great day.